got uh, we've got a lot of people here, which is terrific. Thank you very much uh, all for coming. Really, really appreciate um, all of you making the time. Um, good morning, if you're uh, to my west. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, if you're sort of around where I am in the UK time zone. I know Tony and Jennifer, it's morning for you. Uh, it's sort of evening for me, it's lunchtime in between. And, and thank you very much as well if you're coming in from the east, because that's showing a, an admirable level of commitment, which we're very grateful for. So thank you for that. Um, I'm super excited uh, to host this session. It's just great uh, to, to be able to bring this together. We um, we at Titan Partners are delighted to be sort of um, working with SOCAP on some of these sessions. We wanted to bring some of the real thought leaders in the impact and education space uh, to this gathering. And I'm really pleased that I've got a couple of those people here. I'm a senior director here at Titan Partners, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about the inv impact investing space in education uh, around the world. Um, and I'm going to set the frame a little bit, but then I'm really going to hand over to, to Tony and Jennifer to talk as uh, they're the real practitioners that are doing this every day. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, for a very long time, people have been talking about how education systems need to change to make them more equitable, to allow our kids to participate more fully in society and fulfill their individual potential and to raise their employability chances and, and, and our economy. And I would say that COVID has only highlighted that need around the world. There's also been a long running debate about how private capital can and should play a role in, in that educational transformation. transformation. And we can, we can talk a lot about where it's possible for private capital to play, where it should play, and where in some cases it, it can actually be uh, have have a detrimental effect. We're focusing today on those on the opportunities, however. Where can it really make a difference? And where can it make a difference to driving change in the system rather than just leaving the system as it currently is? Um, I, I am genuinely delighted to have two luminously experienced people uh, in the room with me today to talk about this. Today we're going to be focusing on what I might describe as the global north. Uh, particularly the United States of America. Uh, tomorrow I'm running, running another session around the Global South. I hope you can join it for this, but I'm, I'm just really delighted to have Tony and Jennifer with me today to talk about this. We're gonna run, it, run this like this. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have sort of a short three to five minutes from uh, each of, of Tony followed by Jennifer covering some of the issues that they think are particularly keen. Um, to, to discuss in this space. Um, I'm then gonna ask them a few, we're gonna then have, have our fireside chat. I wish we were all around a fire somewhere, but this is as good as it's gonna get for the moment. Um, and then we're gonna throw questions out to you guys in the audience. We would love to have questions from you. I will be monitoring that and we will do that. We very much like this to be uh, an interactive 45 minutes with you all. So please feel free to pop stuff uh, in the chat and let us know. Um, and with that, um, Tony, I'm going to hand over to you with your, you know, amazing background in both policy and impact investing. Love to hear from you first. Uh, th thanks, Nick, and uh, really happy to to be able to join the group today. Uh, first, you know, the perspectives I'll share are informed by one as an investor, um, and in particular, an education and human capital um, investor in education and then human capital services and technology companies, but also having been a former policymaker in government. And I, I think I'm going to just speak to a number of different themes that I think are important that hopefully we can revisit during the course of, of the conversation this morning. Uh, first of all, when we think about this, you know, the education system at large and the forces that drive it. Uh, I think it's important, again, coming from, a, a, if you will, more of a commercial background, I think it's important to think about it as kind of the supply and the demand for talent. And so I think the good news is there's an increasing recognition on the importance of talent, the importance of talent across the entire ecosystem, be it in for-profits and commercial enterprises, and the need to continue to identify and source and prepare that talent. And so I think that's a that's driving people to to look globally, remotely, look and and source 
uh, talent pools that potentially heretofore they haven't addressed. And you see that, you know, you see that across education, you see that across the corporate community. When you think about that, and you think then about, okay, well, what are, what are then the implications? Okay, other things that are very positive right now. I think the pace of change that are, that's going on, particularly in the labor market right now, the pace of change in terms of new skills that are being provided or that are being required, uh, jobs being disrupted, the negative side of it, jobs being destroyed by technology, the positive side, new jobs being created, that employers are increasingly looking for, for new skills and new skills that will change even going forward. And so I think it's creating a very dynamic opportunity for people in the be it students, be it adults, who are in the marketplace to kind of reskill and better participate. And so I think that is creating opportunity. And so when you think then about the supply side, here's where I think we sometimes struggle. And so when you think about our education system from K-12 to higher ed, the challenge there is it is a publicly run and governed system with all of the implications associated with that. That means for K-12s, as we know, in the U.S., it's highly decentralized. It is funded by government resources, predominantly state and local, complemented by federal. And the allocation of those resources are governed by public processes. And so we have to understand, as you think about then, you know, investing capital, it's important if we're going to have impact, we need to think about investing capital in such a way that from a sustainable basis, it's, it has to be able to participate and be informed by the ultimate funding streams that are going to sustain it. And those funding streams are largely public sources, unless it's truly going to be private funded. That's true for K-12. It's similar and true for higher ed, although the funding mechanism is different and it's largely through, through federal student aid, be it loans or grants. And so I think as you think about the deployment of, of social capital, social impact capital, to really drive change, to take advantage of the changing needs in the marketplace, we have to think about the sustainability of that. That's one. We have to think about the suppliers of that operating in a constrained system because, again, it's publicly governed. It's constrained by, if you will, the bureaucratic incentives, which candidly are, are risk averse, and it's highly decentralized. And I think, frankly, embracing the system for what it is will increase the likelihood that you can deploy social capital effectively. And what I mean by that is understanding its complexity, I, we're finding is solutions that solve real problems, that uh, you have demonstrated impact, solutions that, and they, those can be, if you will, niche solutions. They can also be solutions that kind of have broad applicability. Uh, uh, solutions that, you know, uh, lend themselves to referenceability, because again, you need to be able to reference a given school district, a given university. You need to be able to demonstrate referenceability in order for others to consider you, again, when you're operating in a risk averse environment. You need to think about uh, how do you actually get trial? And so, again, increasingly the opportunity to, to, for these organizations to try these new solutions in a way that decreases the risk are things that we're finding kind of work very well. And so, uh, again, and, and I'll pause, I'll, I'll let Jennifer provide her comments. But I think, again, the, the key takeaways are clearly there's a need, and the need's driven by a changing and dynamic marketplace that are looking for new skills, new talent, and are open for more creative solutions. But you've got to complement that. You have to recognize that the traditional system that's preparing that talent is frankly moving at a slower pace that's risk averse, that's bound by constraints associated with public funding. And so as you think about deploying impact, it's embracing that versus trying to resist that. It's embracing that that I think really allows for some real innovative solutions to break through and ultimately scale. Thank Thanks, you, Tony. First, thank you for, for having me here and inviting. I really appreciate it and excited to be here. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just share a little bit of background of, of how I came into impact investing because I think it provides a helpful lens in, in my point of view. So I started my career as a U.S. history teacher um, in secondary and high school and, and middle school. I grew up in Chicago and I went into teaching because I had this experience when I was in high school where I attended an urban inner city school and a suburban school. 
And I had very different um, experiences with the quality of education. And that put me on a path that I didn't really fully appreciate at the time of um, wanting to dedicate my career to education. So I taught for seven years, but I had this nagging feeling as a classroom teacher that school wasn't meeting the needs of a good segment of the, the population in the school. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I, I knew that I wanted to do something outside of the classroom. I moved out to Silicon Valley in 2000, went to graduate school and really became inspired by all of these entrepreneurs and technologists working on problems um, in the technology ecosystem. And I was at that moment sort of thinking, how can we leverage some of this this entrepreneurial energy and create um, sort of an exogenous force into education to improve it. So I then went to go work for an organization called New Schools Venture Fund, worked there for nine years. It's a venture philanthropy fund nonprofit um, focused on improving education through entrepreneurship, really learned the craft of venture capital at that point, and then split off with um, a couple of friends from new schools, um, my colleagues that are still with me today, and we started Reach Capital about 10 years ago, and we're on our fourth fund. And we invest in, in ed tech um, across the life cycle from early childhood, K-12, higher ed, um, through lifelong learning. We've made over 100 investments in the space. So um, I'll just you know double down on, on Tony's comments too about the space having its own idiosyncrasies and I look forward to getting into what those are but in in some ways that makes it an ideal space to invest in because it is regulated there's sort of a natural moat if you understand the space and you can um, invest in in, in companies that um, take advantage of that regulation and we've we are really excited for the future of, of investing in education it's been it's been a great 10 years but I think it's really changed since COVID um, as everyone knows, and it's it's quite an interesting time. Jennifer, thank you. So, so the first thing I'd really like to explore a little bit with you guys is, and, and Tony, this picks up a little bit on your point that that you know there are there are clear constraints within this market, and what I'm hearing from you is that you know you have to work with the grain of those constraints in many ways to be able to be successful in this, but. We're also looking at a situation where many people would argue our, our K-12 education systems, particularly in the global north, need to change. To your point, they need to change to be producing people who are not only more employable, but also happier in many ways. We're seeing all sorts, you know, there, there are a number of ways across which people are saying those systems aren't working. You're a, for, you're a former policymaker, you know, you were deeply involved in an administration which was actively trying to change the system across the US um, with, with, as I know, a great deal of passion and commitment to making that happen. Do you think, and if so, how can private capital in all its forms work to change the system as well as improve the outcomes within it. Do you think that's possible or do you think that's a very difficult thing to do? Oh, I, I think it is uh, possible. I think it is probable. And I think it is also different, but the level of difficulties varies depending on where along the system you're trying to drive maximum change, especially within a given time horizon. So um, what do I think is especially ripe and you're seeing it right now in terms of trends in the marketplace. And so if you go all the way into employer and employer hiring, right? What you now see, so what you now see is the emergence and it used to be boot camps, but it's taking that boot camp model and saying, wait a minute, there are, there are a whole host of jobs and skills and competencies that I can in fact develop that employer's value. I could do that, you know, short of the cost of a full two or four year degree. And so in terms from a student perspective as a return on investment, you can actually provide them the, the, the requisite skills and competencies that allows them to be more employable or in fact to increase their career trajectory. And so no surprise, you're actually saying private capital, taking advantage of those because in, in, again, given the constraints, many of those programs don't today lend themselves to federal student loans and funding. So you have again, private, private markets, and you can call funding markets from um, income sharing agreements, 
to the providers themselves and you get all kind of the, the, the marquee names of the past like General Atlantic and others, or General Assembly, excuse me, who've kind of provided these programs. And we used to think about them solely in terms of, you know, hacker type programs, coding boot camps, what you're seeing is the proliferation. You see healthcare lends itself to many of those kinds of credentialing programs. And you're seeing that kind of move across different, different elements of, of the labor force. And so I think that's a classic example of uh, this bridge of a gap in funding, a real need that's needed in the marketplace, and you can deploy social capital. If you go then, you say, well, what's the implications? Many colleges and universities are now seeing that demand. And when they're constrained by declining enrollments, which we've seen in COVID, you're seeing them saying, we need to adapt our curriculum. And we need to do so in such a way that perhaps we partner with third party content providers. And so you're seeing that's driving demand. And so you're seeing this, you can be done not just necessarily direct to consumer, but you're also seeing this done in combination of higher ed institutions. So that'd be another example. And then when you kind of go through the K-12 area of the landscape, you say kind of, what are the opportunities? I think it is more challenging, right? And it's more challenging because, you know, right now you see more disrupted learning in the wake of COVID. And so in an area where you're trying to advance to better prepare students so they can transition to the labor force, the reality is we've kind of lost ground to where we were a year ago, two years ago, with the amount of learning loss and what's been disrupted. And the fact that our remote learning solutions have not been nearly as capable, right, as we would have hoped. And that's both because some of the technologies have not been there. They clearly have not been optimized in terms of a system-wide approach. But more importantly, they haven't been integrated with the human capital side of the teacher and the instructional approach and all the professional development that's needed to make them fully effective. So the potential is there. Will it take longer to realize? Yes. But I, again, the potential is there. And Jennifer, you, you bring that perspective of actually having been at the chalk face, if you like, um, throughout this. Fascinated to hear you would say on, on that next year, whether or not you know we can we can drive change as well as you know work with the existing system. Um, I, I think absolutely. I, I I am not of the belief that there's one solution to to kind of fix school, that there's no ready player one like the Oasis portal that it's going to happen bit by bit. And we are going to, we back technology solutions that make um, education more accessible. That's something, the lens that we look at at REACH is how do we create accessibility? How do we bring the content, the tools, the mentors, the training um, into, our, into our system and make it more accessible? Because the story of education has always been one of expanding accessibility. You know, you go back to you know, hundreds of years ago and and what was available for for people in education back then and how that has just increased over time. So that's the way that that we look at it. And I think that, you know, if the tech the Internet is a massive distribution um, network, essentially, and when when we think about what it can, what is the power of it, really? You know, it's it's definitely about accessibility in my mind and how we can leverage this incredible network so that children's kind of education is not tied to their zip code, tied to their neighborhood, but it can transcend the physical and that you can have access to incredible teachers, content, all of that stuff through the Internet. So that's, I mean, that's like very basic example, just to bring it home. What I mean is like, we invested in a company called Desmos. It's a graphing calculator, also a math curriculum. You might have, have heard of this company. And it, what do kids use prior to Desmos? They use the TI, um, really expensive graphing calculator. Well, there's now, Desmos has an online graphing calculator that's free, that has all the functionality of the the ti um, physical calculator and you know far more accessible so that that's what i mean by you know looking for what are these little areas that you can kind of pick off through your investing and make education ultimately more accessible and equitable i just like i just like to build a little bit of that with you you know one, one of the things in, in our work we, we we do a fair amount of work with foundations and family offices and people like that who are thinking about their their, their, their first step or their most recent steps who are very experienced in education. And one of the things that I often find is that 
defining success in terms of your investments and, and what you want to measure to understand whether or not your investment has been successful in, in non-financial terms. Clearly, there are some very obvious things you can measure in terms of financial terms, but measuring that success is often a really crucial point for many people. And I think that the thing that I observe about education as compared to many other areas of impact investment, which I think is very different, is that you know, in if you're in climate or healthcare, there are some relatively straightforwardly agreed measures that, that everybody empirically tends to agree on. You know, we can measure parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. We can measure whether or not somebody does or does not have polio or has or has not had a vaccine for it. In education, defining a quote, good education is, is something of a challenge. And, you know, many, many people will define it in many, many different ways. I'm interested in when, when you look at your investments and you talk to your LPs and your investors, both of you, starting with Jennifer, you know, how, how do you resolve that issue of, you know, how are we going to define success, everybody? What, what, what are we going to agree on? Yeah, it's a, su it's a super important question. Um, we are traditionally structured venture funds. And so we, you know, we do communicate our impact and we do communicate it through metrics, but we are not sort of tied to um, certain outcomes, just, just, to, just to be clear. Um, the way that we go about is first, it starts with the team. We are a team of, we have five partners and we have all um, had, we've all come from, we've all had a personal experience where education has had an outsized impact on our life. So I think that, you know, shouldn't be, shouldn't be disregarded is that just our lived experience um, we have uh, a diverse team is is important to why we're doing this work. Uh, second is we are a thesis driven investor. So we understand we go about digging into the space, trying to understand what are the obstacles that are preventing um, the achievement and accessibility and improvement of education. And we'll do deep dives, market maps. We publish these regularly on our on our website. Um, and then we will go about trying to find an investment in a space that sort of meets the criteria of our investment thesis. Sometimes we will incubate that company and sometimes we'll go out looking for um, that solution. Um, we also look for founder market fit. So we're looking for a, a founder that has uh, sort of lived this problem, that has experienced this problem, is scratching their own itch, as we sometimes say, and we look for companies that are based on educational research. So I have a background in, in educational research. And so we're looking at the literature review and is the kind of logic model that this company is built upon, is there an, a research base to, to back that, um, that thesis up? And then of course we measure um, the customer, the, the demographics of the customers, the, um, the growth of achievement, if that's what that company is, is looking at. And we really look, is this company actually, you know, achieving the goal that they set out to achieve? Is the product working in, in ways that they, um, they had hoped? We also do this thing where we aggregate all of our company data um, from our portfolio. We anonymize it and we just slice and dice the data in all different ways. We share it back with our portfolio so we can really benchmark what ed tech metrics look like across all different um, all different metrics really. And that's really useful to our portfolio companies as well. So we're looking at things like, you know, engagement and how are teachers adopting these products. And that to me matters. Like if, if we trust teachers a lot and if teachers are adopting that product and using it consistently in the way that it was tended to, intended to, then that, that's something that we track and we care about. Hey, would you, would you yeah. add to that? Sure. Yeah, I, I think an, an, an our typical investment is is significantly larger. It's not early stage. It'd be kind of late stage growth and our mid market or even large buyout. And so, uh, one, I think it's important. Uh, one thing we've learned is it's important to, as close as you can, get a proxy for real tangible value relative to your value proposition and not actually customer satisfaction. And I think, and a lot of times the mindset is, well, if I've got a satisfied customer, right? And you can think of measured in net promoter score, they think highly of me, that is my proxy. Um, and I think, that's, I, I think that's an important thing to track. But I think we've seen actually, you know, unfortunately there's been examples where 
customers have been satisfied with the product, even though the product, it may not be delivering tangible value. And I think as an investor and as an owner, it's very important, if you will, to hold your, the organization accountable to delivering tangible value. And that can be efficiency, outcomes, efficacy, but it's more than just customer satisfaction. So one of the, one of the key messages that we deliver, and then we work to metricize, is that notion of tangible value. Um, in that context, and I think it's what Jennifer said, I think the other thing that is very important is to, oftentimes there's an underappreciation of context. And so it's recognizing that different student, different, if you will, customers have different risk factors, right? Have, and so you need to understand efficacy in, the, in a context. And I think that's also very, very important so that you can really understand the attribution, how much is it is to your product and solution versus how much of this is to context. And that can be both don't pat yourself on the back too much and don't in fact hurt yourself too much when, because if you don't make those kinds of adjustments, you can actually get kind of false, false information. And so you know, examples that we would have, you know, probably you know, the largest acquisition that we've made in combination with, with Apollo has been the acquisition of the University of Phoenix. And people have, at the time, and, and probably still today, some would say very controversial, a large for-profit higher ed institution, aren't they exploited? And our view is, no, we actually thought there was tremendous potential. You know, it's serving a, a, an adult learner population. That's, if you look at the 35 million adults who don't have a degree or the requisite skills that's gonna allow them to advance, we think serving them and serving them well is needed and trying to do that in an innovative way is also what's needed. And so, again, shortly after our ownership, management actually put in place something called, for example, a near-term a near term grad weight metric, an on-track metric that says, how are people progressing? Because it's a part-time program, are they progressing at a rate just like you would look at an on-track metric for ninth grade? Are you on track to graduation rate? And, and, and those are the kinds of things that are really looking at grad rates, but moving earlier to says, we're doing a lot and the student can have a great experience, but are they actually progressing towards what we know is gonna be tangible value? And in this case, like most things, what you measure, right, get managed. And so we've seen, literally, I want to say, I think it's 34 months now, 30 more consecutive months on year-on-year -year improvement. And so it's, it's delivering tangible value with respect to persistency, tangible value with respect to graduation rate, and then tangible value with the ability then to monetize that, right, to get the value of that education investment. And I think that's the discipline you need to have as an impact investor is to even though it's hard to try to put proxies in place, but to commit yourself to improving those proxies and getting them as close to real tangible value as possible. Thank you very much. And I, General, I don't know if you want to come in, but um, otherwise I'll, I'll move on um, to, I mean, I, I'm going to move on actually to, to, there are a bunch of questions coming in and I can, I can see them all. So I'm going to move on to those in, in just a minute. Um, unfortunately, no, no good webinar right now can can escape mentioning the coronavirus word um and i know that that both of you have, have have seen this both as a challenge but also as a potential opportunity it has also surfaced surfaced some quite interesting dynamics you know jennifer you and i were, were talking about that the other day in terms of you know new business models emerging and, and perhaps becoming more prevalent so i don't know if given given where we are if you want to briefly comment on what 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 you think is is changing and what you think the op opportunities are that are being surfaced by you know this awful pandemic jennifer maybe start with you yeah, yeah. and just reiterate that it is you know an, a, a tragedy and it is an, an awful pandemic and it's causing a a lot of inequity in our education system um the, I would say one of the, the big, from an investor point of view, one of the big changes is that we have seen a, a flood of capital come into um, education investing. So we started investing in education, I don't know, 15 years ago, and there wasn't a lot of folks that were investing in the traditional venture capital world um, that, that were, were interested in the space. And we have actually closed since March, 21 rounds of financing. So we've closed around every nine days. And what we have seen is that almost all of these rounds are being preempted by traditional venture capital. Um, these are the you know, Lightspeed, Kleiner, um, Andreessen Horowitz, like the traditional venture capital players 
are now looking at education as a, an attractive market to invest in. So that's, that's something that you know, we had not anticipated would happen um, and COVID accelerated that for sure. The reasons for that, 1.5 billion kids went remote. Um, it forced a, a um, parent involvement in the education system that has accelerated consumer education and also um, has just really put a focus on a highlight on the, the, the products that are being used in schools and um, their ability to, to educate the children at home and high, through hybrid means as well. So, you know, a lot of these things were in place prior to, to COVID and COVID really accelerated the pace of um, investing and accelerated the pace of, of progress. I really think it has brought, you know, five to seven years forward in terms of um, usage and revenue for these companies. Like there's a reason when you have, you know, Sandhill VC is looking at these companies um, it's because the metrics are there, and that's what what has caused the the interest in the space. Hi, Bill. I think again, I think what we've seen, I 100% agree with Jennifer that you, it really has accelerated uh, the people's the demand for right online remote learning capability, and I think that has forever changed. Meaning, whether it's, whether I don't think it's a substitute, meaning I don't think it's going to, for, for most, shift to be predominantly delivered online as a better delivery mechanism. And I don't think the research would support that. But one, recognizing that it could be an ongoing complement and that some of those same tools and approaches can be used in the classroom, right? Both of those things are going to be better. And, and importantly, I think it's going to, right, and in, in, in some cases, painfully so. I've got a sister who is a teacher. Uh, and, you know, painfully slow, it is going to, by brute force, help many, many teachers, right, get more facile with different online technologies and tools, right? Um, so with that said, what is very clear, th the equity gap is real, and you see that in just in terms of broadband access and device access. And so we've highlighted the problem, and it's acute. Two, I think we've highlighted, again, the need of, of teacher professional development. I think it's going to have real implications for how do you actually provide the support that teachers need to actually use these tools effectively? And I think in that, I think not enough, if you will, providers of those tools, they are so focused on their tool set, they don't, they don't appreciate that the teacher is having to integrate this in terms of a comprehensive curriculum that fits with their own pedagogical approach, what the district is trying to write, and, or the principal is trying to, the framework that they have combined with the other tools. And so I think the more effective professional development for teachers will be much more holistic. And those providers that have that mindset and approach, I think will be more effective at getting the broad scale adoption. The other thing I think we're realizing, especially in the younger grades, is that many of those tools, just like they need to support the teacher, are gonna to need to be parent relevant. Because I think there's not many parents um, who haven't experienced you know, the pain of, wow, this is really hard. I have a much better appreciation for the teacher. And even when provided the tools, it's like, Having the tool is not enough, right? The whole notion of like classroom management is like, well, how do I deal with, you know, session management for a seven-year-old? Keep them engaged when they get distracted. How do I, you know, plan the day? Like all those kinds of things that are beyond, if you will, the adaptive learning curriculum. It's again, how do you ensure an effective learning experience? I think that's going to create demand for and the use of things that have a parent component, not just a teacher and student component. So I think those are some examples, Nick, I think what COVID has done to kind of excel, you know, accelerate one, the awareness and also kind of the, 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 the use of, of these different tools. I think the other thing, and it's going to my view over time is as follows. There's going to be a shakeout. It's going to be this classic boom. There's a lot of free trials, a lot of conversions. And then increasingly, it will be, wait, we actually need a more integrated approach. Um, and I think that's, you know, maybe three years away. It's not going to happen next year, but three to five years, you're actually going to see more integrated platforms and integrated approaches. And so right now, it's just give me the best of the application. And I think school districts are going to migrate towards, I need more of an integrated approach for, because from a sustainability, managed training, et cetera, that's going to be kind of more, more, if you will, sustainable and ultimately more, more cost effective. Thank you. 
Look, I'm going to move on to some of these questions. I want to try and get through as many as I can in, in the remaining sort of 11 minutes that we've got here. And both, uh, I hope it's, it might be Lucia, it might be Lucia, um, forgive me, which, whichever one it does, and Ankita both have really good questions which are linked. Um, I'm going to intervene. One of them is, what future do you see for educational ventures that are not ed tech? I'm going to have a little comment about that before passing it to you guys. Um, and and, 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 and Keita added to that, um, how do you prioritize between solutions catered to students versus those on focused on uplifting educators? Um, I'm just going to lean in briefly um, because I just have a slight hobby horse about this one. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the word ed tech because I think that there are education companies and there are education companies. And technology is just something that is used in the delivery of education. And a blackboard is a technology, a school desk is a technology, a pencil is a technology, and, com and computers and software are just another technology which works to deliver outcomes along and with all of the other tools that teachers and educators use with, with and alongside kids. So that that I think is is an interesting frame. I don't know how you guys both respond to that, Jennifer. I'd be particularly interested in your response to that. But um, you know, I, I think that you know, separating educational ventures that are not ed tech is for me a bit of a false a false comparison to make because I feel that, that we have education companies. Yeah, that is a tough question. It's uh, we. I guess the way that I maybe. Uh, the lens, I think there's, by the way, lots of amazing education companies that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to pursue venture capital uh, where they're, they're growing nicely and it just, it, 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 it doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. Um, we're, we look at highly scalable companies that can serve you know, huge markets, not just the US market, but, but really international markets. And that's another, um, change that I that I didn't mention is that the kind of demand curve for education globally changed overnight with COVID, and we are seeing companies like Padlet, Class Dojo, um, Nearpod that now have much greater user bases outside of the U.S. than they do inside the U.S. And so those TAMs have exploded, which is also one of the reasons why there's so much interest in the space right now. Um, but I do feel that I, I agree with you, Nick. That I, the the term ed tech is is got all kinds of problems. Um, but I do think of the there's companies that are really about kind of a distribution network that are kind of hard, mm -hmm. that are really about the the platform that can distribute the content. And then there are companies that kind of get closer to the point of instruction. And those companies, the, the closer you are to the pedagogy. The, the more important it is for your product to be based on educational research and to have educators that are part of your company. Um, that's something that we see, a challenge that we have as an investor in the space is that you see a startup you know, of, of young, usually young men coming out of, of, of a school in Silicon Valley that don't have any experience in education and don't really value maybe the, the voice of the educator and you can see that kind of show up in the product. But a company like Desmos, which I mentioned earlier, um, it, more than half of the, the staff there is, are uh, teachers. Um, and so the, the companies that are kind of focusing on that pedagogy really have a, a, a close um, partnership with the, the education piece, I think. Tony, anything to add quick before I move on yeah, to the others? Yeah, I'd say I think there will be a bias towards technology-based solutions. And I think un that's not to say that the need is for a broader set of services, but unfortunately, the reality is when you have a highly distributed system of school districts, schools, site-based decision-making, um, to the degree that you've got a product that can be delivered, right, kind of via the web, that product that can potentially be, if you will, procured over the web, right, and you know, lends itself to a software as a service type business model. That, that, that those are the hallmarks of things that allow you to kind of to scale. And so, if you have an efficacious solution, it allows you to scale. One of the things that have plagued the education industry, in particular, has been just the high cost of acquiring a new customer. It's and so if you're a small lure company, right? It's been hard to have a you know you'd have to have hundreds of salespeople to match what the large publishers have to go in call on school districts, school uh, principals, chief academic officers 
and to kind of sell the features and benefits of your particular product. And so that's one of the reasons why you haven't had as many innovative solutions in the marketplace was a tremendous cost of distribution of just of the sales, sales acquisition. I think technology kind of breaks down and reduces some of those costs and or changes. You can invest in those costs because you can deliver it. And so your delivery cost. And I think that goes, I think, to one of the questions, which is, so what are the implications in for services models? I think services models that can be done through technology are going to be going to be more sustainable, more likely to, to scale than those that are based on real people. And I think when you think about professional development and things that are teacher centric, right, is the notion of how much of that is done in person. But again, a lot of, as we're saying, the capabilities of online learning, a lot of professional development can now and increasingly is being done remotely. And so I do think you're going to see both technology based content solutions as well as professional development and the services component that are still going to lend itself to this, if you will, uh, you call it ed tech or, or human capital tech. Um, on that point, sorry, just to interject on that point, the, um, the also Desmos has 50 million monthly active users. They have not spent a penny on marketing or sales. So, the, you know, this is, the world has changed. No longer do, do we, you know, drive up in a, in a car to a sales just to a district and, you know, get out our CD-ROMs and, 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 you know, sell software that way. But Mystery Science is another company that is, is huge distribution, has, does not have a sales team. So it's, it's really changed. So I'm going to try and roll, this is, this is going to be ambitious, but I'm going to try and roll up three questions into one for us to answer as, as, as possibly the final question. And, but, you know, there's a lot of questioning around where capital should go and why, particularly and, and where it has gone. So, um, you know, um, Jean Hammond is saying, you know, a lot of the capital she thinks from her perception is going into workforce or workplace um, education rather than K-12. There's uh, a comment from Debbie Friedman around she's curious whether or not, you know, people are looking at school nutrition, which is almost at the other, you know, the other end of that spectrum in terms of engaging with that and other models around that. There's another question around where can debt play a role from from Mark Medema? Uh, and, and there's a questioning of whether or not people should, you know, should be making large amounts of money out of education ventures. So I guess the question I'm coming to to, to cover all of that is, you know, where do you think impact investing in education can, can and should make the most difference with all the different models that are available? You know, and, and, and how do the different instruments available to it? You know, you're both equity investors. Some, Tony, you may use debt as well, Jennifer as well. Just interested in as a wrap up, you know, where where do you feel it can make the diff most difference and where, you know, do you sometimes think that it, it can't? I'd be, I'd be interested perhaps answering that in reverse order to give us a hopeful end. <laughs> Jennifer, let's start with you. Yeah, it, my my uh, my viewpoint perspective has changed over time on this. So I came out of you know I had never worked in a for profit before I started my own venture fund, and I was a t classroom teacher and then I worked at a nonprofit. And while I worked at the nonprofit, I witnessed a lot of very well meaning philanthropists that decided to create solutions for low income and underserved um, kids. And what happened was you, they, were, they were putting capital into nonprofit um, and building their own technology. And you know, meanwhile, there was another system, venture capital, that was fueling um, other types of technologies for education. And so we ended up with the crappy version for poor kids, the crappy technology for poor kids, because they couldn't hire great engineers because they were undercapitalized and they, they were not the best solutions. And I was very turned off by creating a two track system where you have really crappy solutions for low income families. And then you have amazing consumer technology for you know, affluent families. So that's what really drove me into venture capital. And I thought, okay, here we have this system that is completely remade industries fintech biotech health tech you know all kinds of all kinds of industries and these industries are high stakes too biotech health tech is a very high stakes industry we need to have um, informed domain specific capital in education um, at the earliest stages especially because they can can find the the solutions that are founded by founders 
that are building them on you know education research that have um, teachers on their team and are you know are have logic models that make sense in this world so i guess like i i'm i know that's that's a point of view that may not be shared by by many people but i have I have evolved from um, my role as a teacher and as a nonprofit and thinking that, hey, let's leverage this system of venture capital and in, and in our capitalist world that we can bring the best tools to teachers, to students, to families because they deserve it. And I'm just yeah. going to Tony because I want to give him in a circular way, give him, you know, a chance to kind of finish and, and where we started in a way. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I'd say, um, I tell you, you know, like it or not, right, at least in America, right, the, the ability to deploy private capital to drive innovation is proven, right? We are one of the most creative, innovative, you know, societies, in part because we deploy capital effectively. And so that's why you get things like Apple, right? And that's why you get Netflix, right? And you can see all this is like, we deploy capital, you got talented, creative people, and they kind of bring solutions oftentimes to problems we didn't know we had. Education, we know we have a problem, and we know we have a very tough problem. So I think deploying private capital against to drive innovation in, in some of the against some of these tougher challenges, I think, is in fact a good use of, of private capital. It taps into what we do well. The challenge, as Jennifer said, is you, if it's only geared around making money and it's not geared around real outcomes, real solutions to problems, how do we get more poor, disadvantaged kids better educated, better prepared for jobs? Then that's a misalignment of capital. So it's got to be applying the capital and against a known problem. That's one. Two, in the context of debt, I would say, right, the reality is if the debt providers, right, if you just think about how investing works, the reality is, you know, oftentimes harder to serve students and segments have a higher cost to serve. It's not something we like to admit. And I'm not saying money is the only thing that matters, but the reality is oftentimes they have a higher cost to serve. And so if you just leave pure capitalism, right? Money will always go to the people who are easier. My margins are better. It doesn't cost me as much. So I'll just serve, you know, I'll serve suburban soccer mom families. I'm being obviously, you know, you know symbolic here, but you know, I'll do that because it's a larger market and my margins will be better. So if you just frame it on pure capital outcomes, that's not good. Where debt providers can basically reduce the risk of people who are deploying equity such that you can now between equity and debt still deploy private capital solutions for harder to serve segments. So I think there's a, there's a role to think about where debt can play against some of these problems. I think as then you think about kind of the nature of it, I think like anything, water finds its own level. I think going where one, the markets are biggest and two, where you already have natural alignment, where it's a priority of the decision makers who are trying to, because everybody, as we all know, there's not enough time and trying to drive change takes a lot of capacity. And so you want to be part of the part of the solution versus trying to convince somebody of the solution. And so that's where I would say, as you think about these different market needs, I, I'm not arguing against a thousand points of light, right? Is there an opportunity? But I would argue what has often happened against some of these problems is it's just been a thousand points of light, and we've got a shortage of really scalable solutions that make impact. And so that's what I would say is a slight shift to more focus, more strategic application and a more sustained investment if we're really going to get at would have been some